but uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this. This is a sketch of just one person's conception. Uh, there are many, but they're all very similar. It's 300 cubits long and 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits high. So far, there's no contest. The question is, what's a cubit? Now, it is classically the distance from your elbow to your fingertip. The question is, OK, that's, uh, it, it, we, what's the, what's the uh, average length? Well, how big are the people? And you get into all kinds of questions. So as you start digging into the length of a cubit, you'll discover there are literally dozens of definitions, so only slightly different. There's the royal cubit, the Egyptian this, and the Babylonian that, and I won't go through a whole list of those. But they vary from as small as 17 inches to as long as 25 inches. Most textbooks just resolve this issue by assuming it's 18 because it's a comfortable measure. It's probably not far from that, given it, give or take an inch. It might be a little bit longer. Some believe it was 22 inches. Some believe as long as 25. Well, let's assume it's 18 inches, which is the conventional assumption. That means that this barge that Noah was building in his driveway for 120 years, can you imagine? <laughs> now, by the way, the scope of this thing, it, you know, that would, that's longer than a football field. You'd have a tough time squeezing in in the typical stadium. That is a big project. 75 feet wide. The beam is 75 feet wide, if I'm using an 18-inch cubit. And it's 45 feet high, three decks high, plus maybe some people say figure the top was a fourth deck. Who knows? The window is all the way around. It's not like a, you often see these little children's sketches in books, a little window that he peeks out of. No, what we believe it was is there was a, a window, like a transom, around the entire perimeter. And that would make sense to get air, relieve the smell, and so forth. A very practical answer. So we imagine, we don't know, we imagine that it was probably like a transom situation. And uh, one cubit, about 18 inches, uh, transom around the side. And that's a, that's a very common building technique in a number of uh, contexts. The question is, OK, what does this translate into nautical terms? Well, if this thing is 450 feet long and, 50, and 75 feet wide and 45 feet high, and let's assume its density is such that it, it, um, it, it uh, sits about half, you know, its draft is about half its height then its displacement would be about 24,000 tons. There's about 64 pounds per uh, cubic foot uh, of, of seawater. And we're assuming it's fresh water would be 62, not big deal, deal difference. Anyway, um, that turns out it would include about 1.4 million cubic feet. To put that in practical terms, that's over 500 railroad cars. Okay. Now, you say, what does that mean? Well, you can get, that would hold about 125,000 sheep. And scientists estimate there are probably something like 18,000 species of animals that would qualify. We're ex excluding marine animals, of course. So we've got 18,000, and most of them, most of them are smaller than a sheep. There are a few large ones, of course, but not that many, and especially if you've got young ones. So, so trying to put, uh, if you've got room for 125,000 sheep, you could probably arrange to have 18,000 species. And, uh, so, and I won't quarrel with what's a kind and a species for this discussion. There's a whole other nightmare you can get into there, but let's leave that alone. But just to give you a perspective, by the way, this is about uh, the, the, the Titanic was a little bit larger. Well, actually, the Titanic was not quite twice as long, and it displaced roughly about twice the tonnage. So this is like one half the size of the Titanic in length and in displacement. I say displacement. You know, I remember when I was in the Naval Academy, one of the upper class would always ask you, what does the USS Missouri weigh? And of course, you didn't know. If you didn't know the answer, you could never say, I don't know. You have to say, I'll find out, sir. And so you'd have to go around to his room that night with the right answer. Oh, that way, if you didn't know, he'd say, I want you to memorize what every class of ship in the US Navy weighs. And you go back to your room and spend a couple of hours memorizing phase fighting ships where you'd get all the different classes to get to the upperclassman's room that night and discover what he was, that the, that every ship weighs the same thing. It weighs its anchor. It displaces 66,000 tons or whatever. So, you, you know, it's one of those things, part of, part of the initiation of the academy. But anyway, so it's displacement. It doesn't weigh so and so much. It displaces. And it's de determined by how much water it displaces. That's the weight. The weight are equal. Let's assume, I assume a 25-inch cubit 
uh, uh, rather than 18. Then it would be, it would be uh, 625 feet long, 104 feet. That would make the displacement over 65,000 tons. That would rival the Missouri, by the way. And uh, it would have 4.1 million cubic feet, which would be the equivalent of four, over 1,400 railroad cars. Uh, that would give you almost a third of a million sheep, and you still have only 18,000 species. So it, 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 who knows what size this is. It, it's amply big enough. But let's talk a little bit about these interesting dimensions, whether cubits or feet doesn't matter, we know that it's 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits deep, and let's assume it's carrying weight that lets, lets it have about, a, let's say, a 15 cubit de, uh, draft, okay? Now, of course, its weight is concentrated in its center of gravity, which would be in the middle. It has a weight coming down, and it's got a buoyancy that's going up that's equal. Follow me? That's why it sits in the water. It's balanced in its equilibrium. Let's assume it tips over. To prep from wind or waves and so forth. Gravity is pulling down through its center of gravity, but the water that is displaced is pushing up at it in as its, its buoyancy. But you'll notice that it's going gonna, it's gonna to have the center of buoyancy will be at the centroid of a triangle. If I, if I knock it over about 30 degrees, center of a triangle, at the centroid of the triangle is offset from the gravity. So this forms a couple tending to straighten it out. You follow me? Because the upward pressure is attempting to move it counterclockwise in the diagram. Follow me? So, and they're equal, of course, but that's what's called a couple. It's a moment. And uh, it turns out this particular design, uh, as long as the center, uh, the, the vector of buoyancy is above the center of gravity, it's stable. It'll right itself. And this particular design, it can virtually go almost to 90 degrees without tipping over. It's incredibly stable proportions. And uh, so either... Uh, Anyway, it's interesting that, uh, it's, it's no surprise, of course, that God knew what he was doing. And so, <laughs> but I mention that because these things, what, what I'm sparing you, by the way, uh, is the, the narratives of the flood accounts in virtually every ancient culture, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, you name it, they all have their myths, and they're all alike how the earth was flooded and God pointed this one guy to build a boat and save his family and the animals. That story, in its essence, is embodied in the legends of every ancient culture. But as you, it, on the one hand, there are points of similarity that are fascinating. The doves and the raven are being examples. There's some elements of the stories that are all, they're very similar. On the other hand, they're so fanciful, they're absurd. What's interesting about the biblical account, obviously it's the true one, but it is that the proportions are rational and have stood up to scientific scrutiny.